Hello, beautiful people. <laughs> I want to talk about places and the power that places have to connect us to each other. When we learn the history of a place, it gives that place a new meaning for us and we experience it differently. It has the power to change us as people, as individuals and as communities. I'm a historian, I do a lot of work in historic preservation, so obviously I think that the history of places is pretty important, but I suspect that some of you might need just a little convincing. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about how it is that we most commonly come to know the places where we live, the places that we visit, how do we experience them, how do we move through them? And I think that we, we move through places in really one of two primary ways. That first way, the most common way, is disconnected. We're just trying to get from point A to point B. We're not paying attention to what's around us. We're probably trying to keep that five-year-old from killing the two-year-old in the backseat of the minivan. But we are distracted. And so we're disconnected. But this is not the only way that we have to move through space. We can also travel through our world mindfully and thoughtfully. When we do this, we pick our heads up, we pay attention to what's around us, and then we engage with it. We ask questions about that place. Why is that building there? Why in that style? Who built it? How much did it cost? What was it used for? And when we move mindfully like this, that's when we activate the power that places have to change us and connect us. All right, I want to tell you a story about a place and a whole bunch of people who were changed, transformed, really, when we moved mindfully through it. This is the old Raton Ranch campsite. It's also called Baca Campsite. It's located in the Lincoln National Forest, which is in south central New Mexico. And the first time that I visited this campsite, I was there to document one tiny piece of its history. And that is that for the year of 1942, the old Raton Ranch campsite was a prison for 32 Japanese American citizens who came from Clovis, New Mexico. Now, I was there as part of a project that was a collaboration to preserve and interpret this site. It included survivors who'd actually been at this camp as children. It included members of the Japanese American Citizen League, all kinds of researchers and scholars. And together we were working under a grant from the National Park Service's Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program. This project, by the way, is in its final phases and continues through the Public Lands History Center here at CSU. I think most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the history of Japanese American internment during World War II, but what you might not know is that in that fear and that frenzy that followed the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, all of the people of Japanese ancestry who were living along the Pacific coast in this area that the military called military zone number one, these people were forcibly removed from their homes. Many of them separated from their families, they lost their belongings, they lost much of their property, and for the duration of the war, they were held in American concentration camps and confinement sites that were primarily located in the interior west. Now, far removed from the western coast, all the way over in eastern New Mexico, on the border with Texas, in the tiny little town of Clovis, New Mexico, 10 Japanese families lived. These families, 32 people in all, worked, um, lived in a segregated part of town. The fathers worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. Some of those families had been there since as early as 1920, so they were established members of the community. Now, the very same day that Pearl Harbor was bombed, the railroad suspended its Japanese workers. It was afraid that they might pose a security threat. They were afraid that there might be violence that erupted between the Japanese workers and the other workers. And so it suspended them indefinitely and without pay. And those Japanese families were forced to stay in their homes for weeks. They were cut off from the rest of the town physically. They were cut off from supplies, from food. As they learned about the rumors that a mob was materializing in town, rumors of plans to lynch these families. 
Now they lived under this constant threat of violence for over a month until finally in late January of 1942, they were taken into federal custody. This was partly to protect those families, but it was also partly to appease the rest of the community members of Clovis. And so they were taken into federal custody under the cover of night. They were whisked away in black sedans and they were driven down back country roads with the headlights off almost the entire 200 miles to the military installation of Fort Stanton. They stayed there for only two days and then they were taken to the old Raton Ranch site where they lived for the next year. After that, these families were moved to the larger confinement sites in places like Topaz, Gila River, and Poston, which were in Arizona and Utah. They joined other Japanese Americans. Very little remains of this World War II history at the old Raton Ranch site today. There's this rock chimney that was once part of one of the buildings. There are scattered remnants of foundations, concrete blocks here and there. There's a old uh, remnants of a rock fountain and reflecting pool that the prisoners built. And there are these initials carved into a tree by children who were held there that year. But because this has become a popular Forest Service campsite, many people have started to argue for the removal of this historical trash, they call it. They want to make this a more natural wilderness camping experience. And this, I think, is a really bad mistake. This is a dangerous move that obscures this important human history that occurred here. Now, when I was there to document the history of this site, I realized just how interested people really were in this history. I was there with an archaeologist colleague who sent me off to take photographs of the site. Apparently, I make a very poor archaeologist assistant. I have no idea what to do with those tiny shovels. I don't know. So he said, go out there, take photos, get away from me. Um, and I came across some campers and uh, understandably wanted to know why I was taking photographs of their tent. So I explained to them that this had been the site of a World War II confinement camp. And they were stunned. They had no idea of this history. In fact, they told me they'd come there to escape into nature. And they were disturbed by the fact that this natural place had this dark human history. And as we talked, I explained to them that before the old Raton Ranch was the World War II confinement site, it was a civilian conservation corps camp during the Great Depression. And before that, the Forest Service had acquired this land to harvest timber and to extract minerals from it. And before that, Anglo settlers had grazed their cattle there. And before them, Spanish colonial settlers had done the same thing. And before them, Native Americans had come to get fresh water from a natural spring that's still there today. Well, as we were talking, I noticed the woman was, she was paying attention to me, but she was kind of looking beyond me, scanning the landscape. And all of a sudden, she interrupted the conversation. She went running over to this piece of concrete in the ground, and she said, is this something? Is this a piece of your camp? Is this something important? And I was, I was actually very glad to see her enthusiasm because I was afraid I had really ruined their camping trip. And I realized that they were now mindfully engaged in that place in a new way. And when I walked away to finally leave them alone and take the rest of my photos, I heard the one say to the other, you know, I feel kind of weird camping here. It feels a little disrespectful somehow. That place, the meanings those campers ascribed to it, the experiences that they had there, it was transformed forever. Now, often, it's much easier for us to move mindfully through places we visit. We're much better at wanting to learn about things that are not familiar to us, people who seem exotic and interesting. But when we get all caught up in the business of life, it's very easy to become distracted and disconnected from our everyday places. My time at the old Raton Ranch, though, reminded me that familiar places can be just as transformative as those we visit. Just a few minutes after I left my new camper friends, I encountered a group of local people who were actually coming to that natural spring that I mentioned to get water. They'd been doing this every month for years and years. And like those campers, they had no idea of the World War II history of this place. And when I pointed out to them the remnants of that rock fountain and the reflecting pond that the prisoners had built for which they diverted water from that natural spring to fill, 
This place became more than just a watering hole to those locals. And I really can't sum it up any better than the one gentleman did himself when he said to me, oh, so this is sacred ground. When we connect to the histories of places, what we're really doing is connecting to each other. The project I worked on to preserve and interpret the Old Raton Ranch with survivors, with community members and scholars, this project kind of had a snowball effect. People got so excited about the history of the Old Raton Ranch and the history of the Clovis Japanese that they started their own projects. And one of the most exciting things to emerge from this snowball effect was a real conversation between survivors of the Old Raton Ranch, people who had just been children during the war and their families, and the current day residents of Clovis, New Mexico, many of whom had no idea of the history of this place they moved through every day. So just last year, the town of Clovis, New Mexico formally apologized to those Japanese American families and invited one of the survivors to serve as the master of ceremony for their uh, annual town festival. So the project I worked on, all of its offshoot projects, they all have the same core questions, and they're big questions, they're important questions. Questions like, how did we let this happen? Questions like, where exactly is that line between protecting civil liberties and protecting national security? It's not too difficult, I don't think, to see that these are questions about our past, but they're also questions about how we can do better. So places like the old Raton Ranch, and really all places, they teach us about who we were. They also teach us who we want to be. And so here, finally, is my call to action for you and me today. Let's move mindfully through places. Let's get to know the places, especially our everyday places. Don't let their histories be passed by. And what's more than that, we can do more than picking our heads up out of our cell phones, I think. Let's grow new meanings for places by telling our own stories about them, by sharing our histories of places. We are so fortunate to live in a time where we have access to methods of communicating our, our ideas instantaneously to the entire world. So post your stories on Facebook, on Twitter, or if you're adverse to technology, find a local preservation office or a historian or start your own interpretation project. If you're sitting there still wondering why you should move mindfully through your everyday places, why you should tell your stories, let me leave you with this. To recognize the multiple and even conflicting meanings in a place, that is a form of social justice. When we recognize that natural places often were shaped by human action and that all of human history has occurred in a natural context, well, that is to become better stewards of our environment when we are all actively engaged and participating in remembering and describing the places that are important to us, all of those multiple layered histories, they can't be ignored. And histories that were once erased from landscapes become visible once again. That forces us to take better care of the places where we live, the places where we visit. And so ultimately, we're taking better care of each other. We all know better, so we all do better. Thank you.